Hello students, uh, this is the next video in the series about kind of creating our own data from scratch. Uh, if you recall the previous two videos, we explored concepts around coordinate systems so that we could understand where we are in the world and what we looked like. Uh, in the previous video, we just got right down into it and started drawing some shapes, some really goofy polygons with some goofy names, but really just to kind of prove the point of how you take something and start from scratch. This video is going to continue along with the last one, but teach a new way of doing it. And if you remember the last time, we right-clicked the folder, we went to new and we created a shape file, right? a feature class, but stored directly as a shape file. Now I'm actually going to teach you how to create a feature class within a geodatabase. And so for the purpose of this video, understand a geodatabase just as a repository, right? a, a mechanism for storage in ArcGIS uh, that allows you to save space, that has certain rules for being able to build relationships um, between a series of different layers, uh, that allows there to be rules around editing and some greater structure. So it's really just a, you know, kind of a, a more organized uh, way to store um, and organize interesting to say, more organized way to organize, but that's really what it is, right? It's just a more efficient way to organize your spatial and non-spatial data, particularly across, um, you know, a large network or a large system. And so we're going to create a geodatabase, you know, we'll call it our GDB, right? you'll often see that for geodatabase. And for right now, it's it's almost as just we created a folder, right? It doesn't exist uh, as anything other than just a storage mechanism right now. If you right-click it, as I always recommend, you have a lot of ways to do. Look at that. Right? Remember that term, default geodatabase. Something that I will continually remind all of you of, probably until you graduate. Any of those times you do a form of analysis and your layer suddenly disappears, it's because everything goes to whatever your default geodatabase is, unless you tell it otherwise. So you could obviate that problem right here, make uh, one you create your own, and you always know where stuff goes. I'm not going to get into anything about distributed and administration. For now, really what we're going to be focusing on are, are three things here. New, import, export, and then properties. Uh, you know, first thing we're actually going to do is go into properties. And I'm going to ask you to just follow me here. It's going to sound weird because usually the way I, I structure these videos, uh, you know, they're meant to be the point and click methodology. Uh, I know that our class structure is a little bit different than what we would normally get under normal class, right? Normal classes, we spend all of our time in class, um, you know, really trying to apply the ideas and to break them down conceptually. And then the videos are used as just, you know, point and click so you can get the muscle memory. You know, we've kind of had to do a hybrid for these videos, unfortunately, but, um, you know, really that's their purpose. And so normally I would try to walk you through in a linear fashion step-by-step uh, step why we do something, but right now I'm going to ask you to just do something and trust me, knowing that we're going to go back a little bit later and uh, define why I've done what I want you to do. So first thing I want you to do is under field type, I want you to go to text, and I want you just to call a domain name here that's type, and our description is going to be uh, type of land use. And then down here in code, I just want you to type a couple. I want you to type park, and that'll be, uh, um, you know, park. And then I want you to type building, and that'll be building. And then I want you to type road, and that'll be road. And then I want you to type water, and that'll be water. That's all I want you to do right now. Just trust me on it and do it. And hit apply and OK. So when you're working with geodatabases, there's two ways you can go about it. And the first way, you can actually simply import something, right? So that's kind of cool. Right? A geodatabase can store rasters, it can store tables, and it can store feature classes. When I say a feature class, I, I essentially mean a vector form. So a point line, a polygon, something that we, we usually are calling a shape file. I can bring multiple in at a time, or I can just bring one. Right, so let's just play around with that just so we can get comfortable doing it. All right, what do I want to bring in? Let's just bring in that Philadelphia correct. That's where we're storing it. What are we calling it? Let's just call it Philly. We don't need any expression to define if there's a subset of features. We don't need to worry about the field map or the geodatabase settings. We're simply taking something that existed right previously as a geodatabase. 
Oops, got a little ahead of myself here. What I really should do is one, two, three, four, right? Because I like this area. So I'm going to just make sure I set myself a bookmark here. So then I can turn it off, right? So it adds, adds itself automatically. But now it exists a little bit differently, right? It exists here. And again, this is where probably the... Um, the flux is kind of hurting, so adjust your eyes if you're watching this late at night, you know. Ah, it's terrible, right? The light came back. But as you can see, the reason I did is to show you that this one's blue and this one's green. So just from a practical purpose, right, colors, we're very visual people. That helps us kind of identify the differences. In ArcGIS, when you see blue, it's a feature class within a geodatabase. When you see green, it's a shape file. All right, so a, a very different that I can I can you know uh, open it and I'll see you know it's attribute a couple different things it automatically appends a shape area and a shape length and I can add a random field here and I get all kinds of other interesting things I can add and notice when I add a field here right I no longer have to pick precision and there's other cool things like I can have a default value right so let's just say I, I texted a field that's a text and I'm gonna call it random Yes, null values are allowed, and the default value might be cheese. And then what you'll see here, right, is it comes in as null, which is interesting. I actually thought it would come in as cheese. Foot and mouth shade there. But either way, I'm still showing what I wanted to show about null, right, the idea that you can have a null field, meaning nothing has necessarily been entered there. Right? Much easier way to kind of add fields here. And I can even add fields in another way. I can add fields directly here, right? I can go to properties and all kinds of new ways. Indices, subtypes. Head into fields here, which is somewhere hiding, and I can actually just start adding them, right? A field here would be number, and I could make that be an integer. Right, and then I can head back in here and I see that the field itself has been added, right? So just a cool way to be able to interface with your data. Other thing I can do is I can actually create something from scratch, right? So if you go to new, you have a whole bunch of things. I can store address locators, I can store toolbox, I can store raster mosaics and data sets. Won't make as much sense to you yet because we're not in our raster world. A feature data set, almost like a subfolder, right? So if let's say in my geodatabase I want to store you know, anything that's like like land use features, you know, so maybe like parks and forests and rivers, they can be in one thing. And then anything that's like administrative boundaries, they could be in another, so on and so forth. Not going to talk about these in this class um, other than to briefly mention them right now so students who are interested can explore further. Our relationship class uh, is just something if you, you know, let's say a good example of this is, is a parcel data. And for those of you who are uncertain what I mean by parcel data, that's just, you know, an administrative unit that defines property lines, right? So if you buy a house, for example, you own, uh, you know, not only the house, but also the lot and, you know, the side lots and such, and that equals a parcel boundary. And if you imagine that parcel has all kinds of information that could be attached to it, the parcel ID, the address, right, the age of the structure, the type of structure, the land use, your name is the owner, the sale history, the valuation. And sometimes it might be really prohibitive to store all of that in the same data set. So a relationship class is almost like a join, right? It's a type of join that exists uh, in a geodatabase that allows you to be related between a series of discrete tables or shape files. And what's allowing that relationship to occur is, um, you know, some kind of common field. But here, really what we're looking at here is the feature class. All right, so you want to come in, what we're going to call it, you know, we're just going to call it uh, sample. I'm going to give it uh, an alias member, can have spaces, I can have spaces, right? And it's going to have a weird name when we draw, it's going to be sample, I have spaces. All right, pick what you want it to be, let's make it a polygon. You know, you're going to pick the coordinate system that you want to use here. Again, you will likely not see favorites. So I just always want to pause here for a moment. You're probably only going to see a geographic of projected. So you can know the coordinate system by going through projected, state plane, Pennsylvania. Or you can do this super nifty thing that gets hidden, right? This is one of these times when the muscle memory is good. I hate that RTS just kind of hides it here. 
But if you go here, you can add a coordinate system through importing. All right, so learn from your friends. If you know that Philadelphia Correct or Philly or whatever you've created previously is the correct coordinate system that you want to use, you can take that coordinate system on by import. Voila, much easier than having to remember all of those coordinate systems. XY tolerance, we're not going to dive into too deeply other than to say like if you're drawing two points and if you actually like maybe they don't touch each other because you were a little off on your editing but if they're this close then they're basically treated as being able to touch each other. Could start adding fields if you want to. That's kind of interesting. I'm going to wait on that for a moment. Although maybe we'll, we'll make our field type. The type's going to be text. We'll get to what I want to do next. All right, so we got something that's called sample. Now, if you remember a little while ago in the GeoDatabase, I made you create a domain. And the reason I did that is because a GeoDatabase gives you a little bit greater control over the kinds of values that you're allowed to put in fields. So envision that you are setting up an application and you have a series of employees working under you and you need to go out and collect some information about a series of vacant lots in the city. right? Maybe you work for the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and you're ultimately determining uh, the intervention that's going to be needed on those lots. And so you want to send people out and they want to maybe survey the condition of the lot, the height of the grass, um, you know, whether or not there's a school on the block, any number of things. And you realize that sending three or four people out to do the same kind of collection may unintentionally result in any number of answers, right? Some people may spell one word one way, some people might spell other. So maybe you want to control what someone can put as the values. And that's the purpose of a domain. This defines its name. This domain is called type. I could call this cheese. I could call this bloopity bloopity bloppity bloop. It doesn't matter. The point is it needs a name that you'll reference later. This reference, well, what it is. Could it be integers that are between a range? Or in this instance, is it text that has coded values? You see this word coded values here? Let your mind wander to see, ah, there it is here. We can draw a connection between these two to know that these are going to be the values that are allowed in that field. So I've set the domain here. Now I simply need to link a field to that domain. Aha, we've named a field here type. But again, I could call that bleedy blee, right? I'm making it type just because it's easier. We have a field named type. It's a text. Its alias is type. We're allowing null values. It doesn't have a default and notice domain. And I'm able to select from the domains that I created. Now again, I could have named that domain, you know, cheese blargan, whatever. Doesn't have to be the same name as the field. It was just easier for me right there. And now by doing this, a couple of neat things are gonna happen. When I start editing, I'm only gonna be able to use those values. But there's something else pretty neat that's gonna happen. So let's right click at this and go to edit and we'll start editing it and I've got these things I can actually go up here actually rather than do it through here why don't I do it here yeah let me take a, a quick sidestep I'm gonna go and I'm gonna save my edits one of the neat things I can do is I can actually go to the symbology here and I can go to categories and I can go to type and I can tell it to add all values and that's pretty darn interesting, right? There are no values. There's nothing in the attribute table. But because it has a domain, right, it'll allow itself to add its potential attribute values. And this is actually really cool for when we start actually editing things. Because I can just select what I want to draw, and the attributes are going to populate themselves automatically. Right, so I got my colors and my template set. Go back here and I'll edit it. 
Oops, I guess I must still be editing. Stop the editing. Go back here and I'll edit it. Make sure I'm going to build a new template. And there you go. By building a new template, look at that. I've got each of the four things that it could be. And so that's kind of cool, right? So I can just walk in and if I want to start drawing a park, right, I've selected park and my mouse is going to mess things up, guys, so it's not going to be as accurate as I wanted. But I can start drawing a park, right? <laughs> Didn't line up exactly there. So let's just get rid of this because it's slowing things down. All right, but there's a park. And I can run in and I can see that park has filled itself in the type name. And now I can choose a body of water, which obviously is not a body of water here. But for illustrative purposes, now water has filled it, right? So it's just a really cool, simple way to be able to edit by using a series of values. Neat thing is, if I want to change something, oh, this crazy shape here, I actually meant that should be, oh, and look at that, a drop-down menu that allows you to pick only from a series of choices, and it changes it based on those. All right, I now want this thing to be water, and then it'll end up being water based on the drop-down menu. All right, so that's a geodatabase. Uh, just a more efficient way to store your geographic data allows you a little bit greater control uh, and competency over editing.